A red sky filled with thick black smoke clouds sits above a field of dead men. The sound of anguish and anger harmonizing into a melody that carries over the field of onlookers. Only the remaining members of the Banner of the White Wolf are still alive. Two of their number are set about in the middle of the open road. A falling figure kneels over two of these bodies. The young face of Toman, wailing at the loss of two of his childhood friends. The men older than him look on in despair, and we can see a few of their numbers shuffling uncomfortably. Hope and Yara, you're the only two members of the people here coherent enough to respond. Do you, either of you do anything? Hope will say a, a quiet prayer for the, the fallen. Well, Hope attends to Toman and to the fallen soldiers. Yara will likely turn her attention to Jasper. I don't think there's much she can do about Merrick's current situation, and it seems that's a situation that will sort itself out once he is calmed down naturally. While she is not versed in medicine, she is going to take a look at him and see if there is anything she can do, any knowledge she might recall that can aid him in this moment. Yeah, go ahead and give us a medicine check. Again, uh, she is not versed in medicine, and I think perhaps seeing this much gore has shaken the typically steady woman. So this is what happens. You approach Jasper's bleeding body pinned to a piece of wood through this sword in his guts, and you think the best thing to do would be get him ready for transportation so that you can get him to the medical tent. You heave with all of your might and rip out this blade and out with it um, ropes of his intestines. You have made the situation worse. That's probably what causes the squeamishness. She's seen blood before, but she's never had to directly deal with the wounded. Back in the city's guard, there was always some type of medic or a uh, higher ranking guard that would deal with those issues. So upon seeing the guts, she's going to put her hands up, turn around, and try and find someone else who can fix what she's done. I beg of you, I, I am unconscious. I I beg of you all, just leave me alone. I need a fortitude save. Thankfully, I'm able to somewhat pull myself together, it seems. I just remind myself that, uh, you've seen blood before. It can't hurt you. The most important thing is, is saving Jasper's life. You can deal with your own trauma after this. Yara, you rush off to the medical tent, I'm assuming? To find Darinar? Yes, that seems to be the ideal move, given I have only made the situation worse. All right. Hope, standing near the crowd, maybe, I would say, a little bit in the middle of it, you can see Soren step forward. He looks to Tommen and the young man seems to quiet down for just a moment, a fraction of decorum within the recesses of his mind. Soren's golden eyes shift to the young man as he puts his hand on his shoulder. He says, you have survived your first battle. They have not. This is the price of glory, the death of those close to you. He gestures to the bandits piled next to the two young men. This is the price of victory, blood of those that stand against us. If you cannot abide this, then know I harbor no ill will towards you, though we will leave you in Corwindale on our return, where you can live out the remainder of your days as a farmer, ruminating of what might have been. But if you can find the strength within yourself to carry on, there may yet be a place for you within the banner. Toman, you are special. I see great potential in you. I would have you carry my standard into battle, if you would accept it. The young man looks up at him, wiping away tears. Don't answer it. Think on it. Get back with me in a couple of days. His hand falls from the boy's shoulder, and Soren walks off. Merrick, can I get a will save from you, please? How long does it usually take you to calm down after one of these episodes, Merrick? As soon as he sees that there are no more threats to him or uh, the others around him, it, he usually snaps out of it very quickly. I think that's seeing everyone here put in so much danger by Hawk probably aggravated him a little bit more. 
though it takes him a second or two to realize that it's it's over. And as soon as his uh, scream of rage and victory comes to an end, he's calmed himself down and burnt himself out. Yeah, you feel this battle weariness kind of wash over you. The gathered crowd is blocking your view from something, but you can see the long white hair of Soren still clung with blood as he leaves the crowd behind him. He looks over to you and his eyes focus on yours. He extends a hand and not in a demanding manner, but in kind of like a, come on over here, bud. Merrick will turn, wrench his greatsword free from Hawk's corpse, causing it to collapse to the ground and drags it over towards Sorbrin. Like there's still a wild look in his eyes, but he's not the feral state he was moments ago. A line in the dirt, coated in the blood of a slayer, trails behind you. And when you arrive about a few feet away from Soren, he mentions very briefly, did exceptionally well. Two men to 40, over 40. I, I don't think he really thinks too much about it. Like he's just like, he just nods. You destroyed their morale, Merrick. When Hawk fell, that is when the true rout began. You did very well today. And he reaches out as if to put a hand on your shoulder and then thinks better of it at the last minute, knowing that he doesn't want to push things too far. And he, his hand drops to his side. Thank you for what you have done today. Merrick will push his greatsword into the ground to sort of lean up on it, trying to stand upright, but there's still an axe in his torso. And he just grunts and nods. It's his horn again. Take yourself to Darinar's tent. See to it that you're patched up. I'll be meeting with you and the other wolves in two hours. Without saying a word, Merrick makes his way back towards Darinar's tent, dragging his greatsword in the ground behind him. A few moments later, you can see the body of Jasper being ferried in by two rather young individuals. You'd say that they're probably about 16 years of age, and they look almost identical, except for the fact that one of them has slightly more masculine features and the other slightly more feminine. The twins, Zion and Zara, carrying a gurney, very gently set it down on a wooden bed for Jasper. The alchemist Darinar makes his way from behind a curtain in the back of the tent. He's got some solution that is still rinsing down his hands, seems to be evaporating into the air before your very eyes, Merrick. And he does not come over to you. He doesn't even acknowledge you. He immediately begins issuing orders to the twins. They hand him medical instruments and you bear witness to a heinous sight. The extensive injuries that Jasper endured at the hands of Hawk the Slayer would have seen any man dead. But something, something deep within the confines of Jasper's being still stirring. You can see his hand twitching as the alchemist operates on him. After a few minutes, a red vial, very dissimilar to that which was wielded by your opponent, is administered through careful use of a very large, centimeters thick syringe. Merrick, as far as you know, poultices like these are worth more than their weight in gold. Here is this alchemist taking a urn, injecting this large syringe, extracting it, and then again and again, you see it happen eight times in a line across Jasper's stomach. And finally, color returns to his skin. His breathing stabilizes, and the man lets out this long sigh. Darinar finishes, turns back to that curtain. This whole process took probably 30 minutes and he returns to you, that substance once more dripping from his hands and evaporating into the air. So, what seems to be the problem? He gives you this wry sort of smile. He just, Merrick just looks down at the axe in his chest. I think I have a splinter. Ah, I had worse than that on my eye. Don't worry, we'll get it taken care of. He gives you a leather belt, folds it a couple times and just hands it over to you. You bite down on it and he tries to Rise the axe free. There's a sickening squelch sound and a spurt of blood sprays along the top of his tent and along his face, his half moon spectacles covered in your vitea. Oh, getting weak in my old age. He just like mindlessly hands it off as if it was a medical instrument to Zion, who the young man takes it, looks at it like, you want me to get rid of this? 
like still holding, like biting down on the belts. As soon as Zion says that, Merrick goes over here. Yeah, absolutely. Zion uh, looks at the axe, which looks over at Darinar, like, uh, okay, hands it to you. I just chuck it on the on the bed behind me. Give me a fortitude save. Oh yeah, you have experienced severe trauma in your lifetime. So after he sterilizes the syringe in the same substance that he's been using on his hands, he returns taking this large urn and handing it off to Zara. The young woman holds it steady as he thrusts the needle back in, extracts the substance and jams in three locations, which you feel each individual jab. He goes into your bone marrow, Merrick, but you hold on and you get through it. Your vision probably goes a little hazy a couple of times, but you you maintain consciousness and coherence. You don't make a fool of yourself in any way. I think Merrick does let out a somewhat animalistic snarl at some point, but he's able to more or less just bite down and push through. You take Darinar and the young woman by surprise. Zion was watching the fight and he saw the end of it. So he maybe not as scared as the two of them. He looks to them and says, you should have seen him. He took down that big one, one that did this to that guy. And he points over at Jasper. Well, that guy gave him an opening. The old alchemist kind of pushes the spectacles back up on his face. I'm sure it was. There's a reason why they're here, right? He looks directly at you, Merrick. I take the belt out of my mouth. Actually, I think the big guy gave him an opening and I point to Jasper's unconscious body. He kind of nods and I don't think they have that dry of a sense of humor about somebody taking him, which would have been a mortal wound. Darinar um, says, yeah, yeah, he really did, but he'll be all right. Give him an hour or so. Give the poultices time to do their work. He'll be up in a little bit. I'm done with you. He like dusts his knees off and stands up gestures that you're free to go. Cool. Uh, Merrick grabs the axe off of the probably now soaked sheets, his greatsword, and someone haggardly walks out of the tents to go find Yara and Hope. Yara is likely already outside the tents, pacing back and forth anxiously. She likely can't stomach whatever Darinar might have been doing to patch up your wounds, so she has been waiting outside to make sure you two are okay. Jasper will be all right. That is a relief. I say, I do believe one of us should get some type of medical training for the future. I think I might have made it worse when I took that sword out of his stomach. Yes. Right. I can find a book. Well, that's a problem for another time. I'm glad to hear that you two will be fine, though. Where's Hope? Saw him praying earlier. You'll see Hope giving some medical aid to, uh few of the uh, less wounded. He's got medical knowledge. Yes, he does. Thorne's going to want to talk with us in a few hours. Jasper will be up by then. Very well. Would be nice to have a bit of rest before all that, but understand the urgency of the matter. Take the time you need. I bet more. Jasper, can him come up after such a wound? Uh, less than ideal, but I'm sure if he's feeling up to it, he'll want to speak with Soren. Yeah, she'll be okay. How are you doing? Physically fine. I must say this battle was far more brutal than those I am typically accustomed to, but that's just part of the job, isn't it? I'll be fine. Most don't have the big one. It's kind of gesturing towards where Hawk is. Aye, that's true. I must say I've never seen someone of that stature before, and I don't hope to any time again soon. <laughs> right. I'm going to rest for a bit. I'll meet you when Sorn wants to speak. And Merrick leaves and goes to find a tree that he can go rest up against and hopefully power nap before Soren needs him. So Hope is tending to the wounded during this time. Merrick is taking a power nap. Yara, what are you going to do? I'll seek out Hope and see if there is anything I can do to help. Something less uh, vital. Uh, I'm sure I can wrap a bandage without causing any additional harm. Hope, make me a medicine check. Very good. Yeah, so you administer medical attention to those that need it on your side. Some scrapes, some wounds that aren't life-threatening, but might be serious if they don't get it looked at soon. They seem very grateful, those that you tend to. And Yara, in helping Hope do this, you seem to improve your standing with them as well. They also seem to be thinking that both of you are, are all right, you know? You're, you're helping them out. 
few hours pass. Merrick, you get a pretty good power nap in. Yar and Hope, you have tended to everybody that Darinar didn't need to attend to immediately, which was not that many people, to be fair. Jasper, you wake up after this two hour period. You are stabilized and you are very sore, but you are in one piece and all of your innards are inside. It's a beautiful day. When Jasper went down, he was still clutching his swords. And honestly, I think he was probably death gripping them the whole time. He would have just woken up and just looked down and look around the tent, look over at the uh, apothecary, push himself up painfully until he's sitting upright. So, uh, I'm still now. Let me guess. The big one got done in by my friend with the axe, right? Zara is currently hurrying to your side to like literally help you up and sit up because you, you do have your full range of motion, but it is very painful. She puts a couple of pillows in the small of your back so you can sit up, right? And Zion enthusiastically nods and says, it was amazing. I presume as much. Sold my life for that one. Glad he used it. Oh, is it bad I can feel every bone in my ribcage? Because I can feel every bone in my ribcage. You're going to be sore for a while, says Darinar. And uh, if you got any you know, digestive issues in the coming days, come talk to me. I'll take care of it. Your, your guts came out. He would pause and then blink and then turn wasn't conscious for very long. I did notice that I was just, <clears throat> sorry, impaled. I don't remember my guts being out. Did that happen after I, that's new. That's, that's new. And he's gonna like lift up his, uh, I, I figure he's probably, he probably wears like under his gambus and he probably wears a bunch of like white cloth, like a very simple white cotton shirt. And that's probably what he's been in, which I'm, I imagine is just all sorts of gross now. And he's just gonna lift it up and just look down and just see like this scar where the hole was. I imagine it's probably healing over. Okay, that that I remember. When did the guts thing happen? Did he just like, he literally does that gesture. Darren R kind of shrugs because he didn't see it. All right, brief, that's painful. All right, I'm going to start walking around. Walk this off a bit. Do you have any brandy or anything here I could have a sip of just to take the edge off? Swore the stuff off years ago. I can't be around it. Yeah, could you bring me my belt then? They hand you back the very same belt that we saw Merrick biting him too. He would grab it and then flip it around until he eventually got to, he has two little water flasks there, two water skins. A smaller one, he'd pop open and just, and it's like rye whiskey. It's like the driest, most unpleasant, it, it's barn whiskey, basically. And he's just gonna top it back off. Well, uh, thank you for saving my life, my friend, uh, all of you. I presume from that injury. Promise we won't make this a habit. And he'll slide off the table with a grunt. Zion helps you up to your feet as Darinar is telling you, now, now, don't make promises you can't keep. Uh, he's just gonna go over to where his scabbards are, put them on, slowly dress himself back up. And once he feels like he's ship shape enough, he'll step out of the tent, probably still cradling his stomach a little bit, but other than that, not too much worse for the wear. You see Hope and Yara outside of Darinar's medical tent finishing up their ministrations to the last individual that they are tending to. I mean, he'll just stand there for a second and then he gets a moment to breathe to start walking over. So, glad to see you two still around. Last I remember, you were what I was, so I'm glad to see that stayed that way. Who's Marek? Can't see him around. Hope, you see Marek sleeping under a tree on the opposite side of the road as Darinar's tent. I pointed in the direction of the sleeping man. Oh, good. He made it out too. He wasn't looking much better than I was when I fly, when I winked out. Less sword where his organs should be though. Good on both of you, by the way. That was a good fight. You did great. Hope it is taken aback by his recovery time. He sees a dead man walking. How are you doing, young? I'm fine. Yara's probably trying to think of a tactful way to inform you that she's the one who inadvertently spilled your guts. However, <laughs> she probably doesn't know you very well yet, and it's not that she's not giving you the benefit of the doubt. She's just thinking perhaps she should wait a bit before revealing that news in case you take it poorly and she would just hate for you to further injure yourself because of her blunder. He would just sort of nod to that. Right, well, I'm going to take a leaf out of Merrick's book, go find myself a nice tree to relax under and probably drink a little bit till the pain goes down. If you need me, I'll be wherever the shade is greatest. 
He's just gonna start like gingerly walking away, kind of a sort of that oh my back kind of posture as he's like holding himself sort of upright with his force of will and his arm. He calls out to Jasper. It'll be too long. The meeting approaches. Wait, no. And he he pauses like towards. I figure he's like maybe twenty feet away or so when you say that, and then he sort of pauses and turns. Wait, what meeting? I I did miss a bit. Is there a meeting now? Meeting with the white one. Yes, Merrick did mention that uh, Soren would likely want to speak with us before the day's end. That slipped my mind, as it doesn't seem to be something that should be pressing at this moment, but he is our leader. Prerogative of officers, you always take a bit of your time. Thanks for letting me know. I'll, uh, I guess I'll drink a little less then, as he continues to limp off. Yours of the mindset that this could have been a parchment. This didn't need to be a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the four of you have been gathered into the mayor's house. The mayor's house was utilized by the captain of the bandits that was previously occupying the village of Urshrit, and it is now, in the past two hours, been cleared out of everything that is not useful to their cause that did not originally belong in this house. Currently, a meal is being served by a very short, tan-skinned fellow. He has a thick afro and a shaven face, and he is very enthusiastically telling you about the meal that he has prepared for the six of you. Soren, standing before he sits down, finishes wiping off his hands, takes a seat at the table, and he says, thank you very much, Joachim. What did you make for us? Joachim recounts that it is goat left in cow's milk for two days that he has braised with butter and served with wild rosemary that he gathered on the road. Soren says that it sounds delicious, can't wait, and opens wine. Joachim sits down with you folks and is the first to receive his glass, being the oldest of Soren's friends in this room. In turn, he pours a glass to each of you in the same order with which he met you. Soren has been traveling around the th two kingdoms, Northern Gosia and Southern Latria, for a long time, and he's been gathering people that he has been traveling with. The mercenary band was not really made into the mercenary band that we know it as today until a little bit over 20 days ago in a town called Corwindale, after he took a mission from a man of the name Lord Corwin. How did you come to be a part of this band? And who is the first in this number? I feel like Jasper literally was looking for mercenary work, going from town to town. This feels like literally the perfect moment for him to have, might have been the first in the gate out of the four of us into this mercenary band. Then we see Soren pouring you a glass of wine. It is actually glass. The mayor doesn't have a lot of nice things, but he does have a pretty decent wine collection as well as goblets with which to drink them of glass. Jasper would raise the glass in appreciation. Thank you, Joaquim. I don't know where we'd be without your cooking. Joaquim beams at you and says, uh, all you've had so far is what I've been able to make on the road. I've got access to a kitchen here. I can't wait. Soren extends the, the glass of wine to the next person. Hope found himself in, in a predicament which led to a duel with Soren. It, it'll lead to another duel soon. So with no airs about it, Soren continues extending the wine bottle over to you. Hope pours you a healthy glass and moves towards Merrick. I feel like Soren found Merrick next. Probably found him by accident and probably in a state similar to what Merrick was when he fought and killed Hawk in that kind of feral frenzy moments and Soren had to calm him down and the two talked for a while before Merrick decided to join the Banner of the White Wolf. In this brief flashback I think we see the first time that Soren put his hand on you and things like did not go well for a second uh, <laughs> before it fades away. <laughs> He probably knows that that doesn't go well out of experience. Yeah, so he extends the bottle of wine to you, pours you a healthy glass as well, and then moves on to Yara. Yara is definitely the newest member after leaving the city of Alabastria and running into an oddly familiar face, Merrick. 
be teamed up with him, having little else where to turn, and knowing that Merrick is a at least somewhat successful runaway, for lack of a better term, she assumed that he would be able to aid her moving forward. And having heard that he was working for this group of mercenaries, she figured this would at least be a somewhat stable tent over her head, and food in her stomach, and perhaps some coin. He's lucky. So finally he fills your glass, and with just a little bit left in the bottle, there's no plate set next to him. There is a chair next to it to him on his right hand side that is empty. There is a glass goblet in front of it. He fills this glass and Soren sets the empty wine bottle on the table with a hollow. He raises his glass into the center and says to victory well earned. He takes a small drink of his glass before setting it on the table. I mentioned it to Merrick but I had to be sure. In the casualty report, it looks like we only lost two men, young ones, but that is typically how it goes. He says with a solemn expression. How long before we move on to the next place? He looks past you, Merrick, to the door at the end of the room. Clearing his throat, he looks back at you. That is why I wanted you all here. Time is very short. We have but a matter of days before we must be gone from here. And Maya, nor his daughter, are nowhere to be seen. I'm sure you're wondering why something like this would matter. They are relatives of Lord Corwin. We are to return, at the very least, the mayor's daughter alive. But that will come in time. We will be meeting again before that is of import. I have need of each of you. Only you can do these things, and I need you to do them to the best of your ability. For they very well may mean the difference between our success and our failure in our endeavors here. If we fail, our pay is cut in half. That will not cover the expenditures it has taken to get us here. That cannot happen. Banner of the Wolf fell by financial attrition. No, that's not acceptable. Merrick, I need you to take a second and three more out into the forests near here. Teach them how to hunt, teach them how to forage for food in these lands. They might know a little bit of Latria, but I understand that it is rough living where you come from. Eric nods. Joaquin, what would go the furthest, do you think, to fill our ranks' bellies? Well, you get a deer, you get a boar, something like that. I mean, there's only like 50 of us, so if you can bring us a boar, we would we'd probably be set for at least a day. And if you can teach them how to get a boar, well, then we'll probably be able to stay here for a while longer. I look to Joaquin. Do you have the means to cure meat here? I used what last bit we had on the road, but there's plenty of stocks in the larder here in the mayor's house. Understood. Soren turns his attention to Yarrow. Apparently, Merrick made a spectacle enough to drive away one of the bandits before he could be felled properly by our blades. One of our scouts was able to catch him before he could escape into the woods. Yara, I understand you worked for the Alabastrian Guard, correct? That is true. I need you to interrogate him. Find out where the mayor and his daughter went. The rest of the townspeople probably followed. Yara will nod, not uh, confident enough to bring up the fact that she probably has never interrogated anyone. She's seen the process before, so... Think she can wing it. Soren affixes his gaze to Jasper. Jasper, I need you to get with Arendelle the quartermaster. Find what you can that is of use in this village. You were a farmer, you said, right? Yes, I was. Well, you are wounded, so I can't be sending you to do anything too strenuous, but find what you can that you think might aid us in our cause. Wagons, for instance, if we are able to secure enough supplies to last us a while, we may as well take them with us. I figure the obvious question need be asked. Will the Lord Mayor be fine with us absconding with his supplies and stock? We are to return him to Lord Corwin. I assume that the villagers will understand. All right, I'm giving my best. He's gonna tip his he's gonna tip his glass up and take one deep swig as he sort of nurses his ribs a little bit. Nothing too strenuous. Understand? I need you fit for travel in two days' time. I'll be fine. It's not the first time I've been injured. First time I've been impaled, but not the first time I've been injured. I'll be all right. I will say, you chose to put me on something not strenuous. Farming's an interesting choice for relaxation. 
I don't need you to do the farming. I need you to find supplies that farmers would leave behind because I don't know anyone else here who would know where to look. I'm being facetious and my ribs hurt like mad. Let me have a little levity. <laughs> just gonna go back to the cup in his hands. I think like just wordlessly, he shifts his gaze to uh, Hope. You are the only person here in our entire number that I can ask to do this. The two young men that passed away, I need you to deliver them without the best rights. Hope will not. Preserve their bodies, however, is natural. See to it that a ceremony is performed. Lead it yourself. We don't. Let us enjoy our meal. It tastes absolutely wonderful. I don't know what you guys are used to eating, but it is very tender. It melts in your mouth and the rosemary just gives you this perfect, like, homey flavor. Makes you feel all warm inside. It honestly makes you all forget completely about the battle that took place just a few hours ago. Uncooked meals are magic, man. Especially that rosemary. So, with a, uh, a good deal of discussion and a hearty meal in your stomach, there is still a few hours left in the day. Hope, you are getting ready to administer the final rites to the two young men. Toman still has not left their sides. Even now, he's not crying anymore, but he is standing next to their bodies. The large pile of bandit corpses is currently being seen to by some of the some of the grunts of the mercenary band. They're digging a mass grave off to the side of the road. Toman sees you approaching Hope and his eyes are red and puffy. His nose is stuffy and he looks quite distraught. My friend, I'm sorry for your loss. He looks like he tries to speak and then all that escapes that kind of <laughs> sound that just that expression that one can only truly make complete anguish. Bradley, we were supposed to, he was my best friend. So for the, the rites, what is typically done in, the, in this land? That's where you come in, buddy. I need you to roll me a religion check to recall the appropriate practices. You remember exactly what you're supposed to do. In fact, you have a very clear memory of your master Amon teaching you this when he was tending to some individuals that required services of your monastery passed away along the road. I gesture to uh, Talmud. I hand him some incense here. This, this may help with the pain doing this work. One of the things that you were able to keep within your, your pack and you probably is it fair to say this, that like you've held on to it for a very long time because it was a specific type of funerary incense that is burned and the herbs imbibe a sense of peace onto people? I'd say that. Yeah, so he takes it and goes, uh, I don't really know what to do with this. Just follow my lead. So you have Toman help you construct a funeral pyre for the two young men. You have him help you put the two bodies side by side on this large circle made in the image of the sun. And after a good number of hours have passed, they will be ready for their their final goodbyes at the setting of the sun. During this waiting period, are you comforting Toman? Yeah, I'm teaching him the, the, the proper etiquette and really taking his mind off the despair that he's feeling is, you know, sending off your friends uh, one last time is a great honor. He hears what you're saying, but he's not really sold on the idea. He's never experienced somebody his own age dying and definitely not in battle. The worst thing that's happened in Toman's life that he shares with you is when his father died in service to the Corwin household. I do a persuasion check. I'll, I'll give him a a recounting of my own trials. Also, you tell him all the things that have happened in Hope's life. And I tell him death isn't the end. There's still purpose. Yeah, that's a good way to pass the time. It's a long story. So, so Yara, leaving your luncheon with Soren, you are told that the bandit is being held captive in a barn right here on the mayor's property. What does Yara know about these bandits? Probably didn't ask very many questions prior to the skirmish. Just having heard you're going into battle and having previously been a guard, immediately going, yes, sir, and putting her gear on. She really doesn't know what their motive is. That's her first task, to go ask some questions and see what she can find out about these bandits before 
questioning the bandit themselves. Okay. So who are you going to go talk to first? Who is under Soren? Who's his second in command? Or at least someone of a higher rank than us foot soldiers. You know that Soren leans really heavily on Arendelle, the quartermaster, to take care of a lot of the things regarding the men. And if they are available, I would like to speak with them and ask a few questions. Sure. I suppose that we would see you and Jasper both walking in that direction then, because that's also where he was told to go. You can see Arendelle setting up a new storage facility in one of the old barns farmers left behind. I approach Arendelle and I'm fairly blunt. I ask, may I have a moment of your time? Promise I shall be quick. Arendelle doesn't really wear armor. She is not a fighter by nature. She is much more a logistician. That is not to say, however, that her hands don't have calluses or that she is shy from work. She takes a moment to set down a piece of leather. Yeah, what can I do for you? I was hoping you might be able to tell me what you know of the bandits that we recently defeated. Not typically my job to ask questions. However, Soren has recently tasked me with just that questioning one of the captured bandits. I was hoping to gain some insight on them beforehand. Right, that makes sense. And that must mean that you're here to help me. She points to Jasper. Well, from what I was able to gather from it, it worked for the Goshins. They were paid by him. That captain that Soren dispatched during the fight, and he was the one in charge of them. He was the one paying them. And what were they doing here specifically? Arendelle doesn't know. She would tell you, your guess is as good as mine. See? Well, well, thank you for your time. She'll turn and start heading in the direction of the barn while thinking. You can hear her muttering to Jasper as you're walking off. So unlike bandits to sit and take root somewhere. I always thought that they just wandered around. And well, now where are you heading, Yara? Uh, before Yara goes, actually, I think Jasper would say, wait up a second and sort of like jog after for a moment. Uh, I'll be right back. I just... Me a moment when he's with you like sort of alone you are able to say if i'm being honest most bandits tend to be places for resources my experience not here for politics but if they're hired by goshens they might have just been i don't know wild dogs basically loosed on these people pressure right that'd be my thought drive them out of the land for some other purpose or make it so miserable that they turn on their lords at least that'd be in that sense mean, but that'd be what I'd do if I had the same decision, the only logical thing I could think of. That is helpful. I appreciate it. I meant to tell you earlier today, but didn't quite know how. Uh, after the battle, I tried my best to aid you, but I fear I, uh, almost did quite the opposite. Seems taking large weapons out of people's bodies doesn't always help them, and... For that I apologize. Oh, that was you then. I actually it makes me feel a little better because I was worried that I had just, you know, when you're stabbed through the stomach and the last thing you see is someone swinging an axe, you're not really that concerned with how you look. And then I come back and I hear all oh, my organs, man. I was just worried someone had done something untoward with my body after I was uh, unconscious. I appreciate your effort to help me. And let's be honest, I'm uh, I'm getting better. So just next time you see someone impaled or something, maybe leave it in, but what are under the bridge, my friend? Lesson learned. Seems that I am better at dispatching of things rather than healing them, but I hope to learn to do the latter as well. Uh, I've never had a mind for healing. That's for others more capable with their hands than me. Good luck, Yara. Likewise. Walk back. All right. So, Yara, now where do you go? Uh, she heads towards the barn and pauses outside for a moment, trying to think things over. It's not sure the best course of action. Back in the guard, they were known for using what was called the peace method, otherwise known as persecute, extort, accuse, condemn, and execute. She doesn't think that's really going to work in this instance. Yeah. Their version of uh, interrogation is probably tell us what we want to know and we'll kill you. After a few moments of thinking, she will head inside the barn and 
see what she's dealing with. You find the man battered and I'll say bloodied as well. He's got a broken nose, a black eye, his shirt is torn, and you can see a shallow cut across his stomach that was probably made more for an intimidation factor. He's bound by his hands, which are being held on the rafters of the barn, and he's just kind of hanging there for maybe six inches off the ground. I see someone's already started on the peace method. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut him down, keeping his hands still bound. There's no need for him to be quite so uncomfortable. All right, make me a diplomacy check. Very diplomatic. Carefully, you cut the rope and help this man down where he can rest on the ground. He lets out a long pained sigh before his eyes open and he looks up at you like, I in heaven. Hardly. Oh God, my ribs. No, no, I'm still here. I look around to see if there's maybe a bucket of water or at least a trough or something. Yeah, definitely. Bring some over and offer it to him. Thirstily, he takes the bucket of water from you, taking the ladle from where you're feeding it to him at first. And as soon as you hand it to him, he just like drinks the ladle and then just like knocks it away, grabs the bucket and upends the whole thing into his mouth. Grab it out. Not much of a healer. I know that'll make you sick. Taste yourself. Your, your boys roughed me up pretty good when I tried to run. I can see that. I don't think an apology will help much with that, unfortunately. Doesn't hurt. He kind of gives you this grin. You can see that he's got a couple of his teeth missing. She just stares at him blankly. She knows exactly what he's fishing for, but she just looks at him as if she has no idea he's hinting for her to actually apologize. Certain they didn't send you here to cut me down and give me dinner. Not exactly, but dinner could be arranged if you're cooperative. He kind of rolls his eyes like, yeah, then you kill me, right? After I tell you what you want to know. I don't see why I'd have to do that. You're a bandit, right? You work for the highest pay, presumably? You're not really loyal to those you were previously employed to. You got it half right. Am I loyal to the Goshens? Fuck no. And he spits blood on the ground. Fuck the Goshens. But I am not a bandit. He tries to, like, sit up to get his hands on the bucket of water again. Keep it out of reach. I'm not trying to be mean, but seeing if he'll finish uh, his train of thought. He looks to the bucket and then like looks up at you a little bit angry. I was a farmer. How does a farmer get involved in something like this? Do you know how many of us lived outside of the law before we were pressed into service by Lord Sweet A? Imagine. Maybe three. Three out of 60. Give me a society check. Just like me, uh, Yara's a bit confused as to what he's getting at. <laughs> Be plain common, please. The bandit looks at you and scowls, and you can see him get kind of low for a second, and then he lunges for you. And that is when the camera refocuses to Merrick. Soren asks you to stay back as your comrades go about to attend their duties. Standing, he walks a little closer to you, takes something out. It is bound in leather and cord and places it on the table. What's this? To the Victor go the spoils. I want you to have this. The cord opens and he picks up the piece of leather to show a very large, very thick short sword. It's only right. You killed Hawk. You carry the memory. He flips it around in his hand and holds it to you with the handle extended. A little small for me, but it'll do. He takes it. It's not for you. It's for the men. When they see you carrying that, they will all remember the first battle where you defeated one that all of them were certain would spell the death of us. See to it that you are always seen with it, whether you wield it or not. I leave how you conduct your warfare up to you. If you say so, he'll tie it to his hip. He gives you a wolf's grin, showing his teeth, and says, Now, there is a second that I would like for you to take. You're under no obligation to do so, but it would appear the ward of Lord Corwin ingratiated herself amongst our ranks. Her name is Amelia. She tends to the horses. She fought today. What do you want me to do about it? Take her with you. Teach her how rough life is on the road, that she's better off living at home with her adoptive father than slumming it with a bunch of mercenaries. 
Thank you. And good job again, Merrick. He nods to you. Merrick will look like he wants to say something, but then just nod and then he'll leave. The door closes behind you and you are under the blue sky yet again. At this point, Merrick will go find uh, four people that he can go hunt with, Amelia being one of them. You find Amelia tending to the horses. She sees you approaching and her face lights up. She's a attractive 19-year-old young woman wearing armor that you can tell is far too large for her. She's of slight stature and she has about her a blue cloak. Oh, Merrick, it's nice to get to meet you. I'm Amelia. I saw you out there today. It was, it was impressive. Armor looks too big for you. Where'd you get it? She kind of blushes and like looks down. Arendelle said they didn't have anything in my size, so I just took some extra belts and cinched it. All right, you're coming with me. She like looks to the horse with the brush in hand, just drops it and starts walking after you. Where are we going? We're going to hunt. Oh my, I, I, I've never been hunting before. Come on, you'll like it. She kind of like... There's that little skip thing when you're excited about something, like just the one leg skip follows after you. I go find three other people. Sure, no problem. You take three dudes off of latrine duty and you head into the forest. Can I get these survival from you, Merrick? Sure. Notably, though, Merrick does not take a bow for himself. He instead simply uses his javelins. They're much closer to what he would have used before. You notice that Amelia has her own bow. It's not not shoddily crafted like some of the other equipment that the majority of people here seem to be using. It is very finely polished, very well kept. You march your way into the woods and it is not too long, Merrick. I would say maybe 30 minutes or so before you come across a trail carved in an undergrowth of these big gray green trees. Upon closer inspection, you are pretty damn sure that's a good sign. I'll like drop down low, look at the trail. I'll look to the other four. They all squat down low and try their best to be quiet as well. Can I get a nature check from you, Merrick, to determine what kind of prey is in the area? This is definitely boar ruts from where they take their horns and grind them into the under roots of tree. But Merrick, there's something peculiar about these markings. They are far larger than a boar should typically be. And you can see blood as if it's rubbed its tusks so aggressively against these tree roots that it's caused itself to bleed. I make a point of saying to everyone, go slow. This one looks a little bit bigger than the rest. I also make a point of looking Amelia in the eye and say, stay back if I tell you. She very urgently nods her head in acknowledgement. You follow the trail until eventually you reach a river. On the edge of this river is a tree with a rock that seems to serve as the grounding point. Branches extend out and over this body of water. Sleeping on that rock, is the largest boar, Merrick, you have ever seen. I will gesture, it's just gesturing, not vocal, quietly point it out to my four hunter companions, and I draw a javelin. Please give me a stealth check. I'm gonna spend a hero point to reroll that. Merrick, you sneak up on this boar, getting as close as possible, and right when you are primed and ready, you thrust the javelin as hard as you can into the spot where its jaw and its ear meet the rest of its neck. It lets out a and it gets up with a start. Panning away from this riverside scene, we focus back in on Jasper, who still meeting with Arendelle is now a little bit more privy to the needs of the banner. All right, I'll do what I can, but I'm just telling you right now, arts are about the most expensive thing that a farmer can afford. You're asking me to acquire the single most valuable good they have. Aye, but here's the thing, Jasper. They had to come out here at some point. They would have taken them on something, so there's got to be someone around here. I'll see what I can do. Just do me a favor. Tell your men to lay off looting the town as fast as I've seen them. I get that the whole, we're here to save them and they should be grateful, but I guarantee you, that's what got people like me involved in soldiering. 
I don't see any villagers around. Just because they're gone doesn't mean they don't want to come back. They might return. And if they do, they'll need every chicken and cow and little speck of grain they can to rebuild. So take what we need, not an ounce more. She stops you before you leave. It's a, she's got this really stern look in her eye. <clears throat> Don't pretend like I don't know a thing or two about bandits ruining a community and nobody being able to pick up after they're gone. Soren found me in such circumstance. When my father died, we took everything that my family had for generations, and we lived in the heartland of Latria. These people sign their own death warrants when they move out here, Jasper. The Moors are a dangerous land. Some call it superstition, but be it bandits, or monsters. This land is dangerous, and you don't move out here unless you're ready to die for a little bit of freedom. He would yank his arm free and sort of wince a little bit as his ribs sort of flex. I'm aware of that. That said, what we're talking about here aren't bandits or monsters. It's us, and I have no intention to be either. You know as well as I do. I come from a small little township ruled by the sort of people that do prey on. Not bandits and monsters. Lords. Officers. People who swear they have the best interests of the people at the heart while they are milking them for everything they're worth. I don't want to be that. You understand me. I understand you. Tough topic. We'll leave it at that. And he gives her this look with his eyes. It's very like, I hear where you're coming from. But both of us are going to be pissed about this if we keep talking about it. I'm probably not going to see eye to eye completely. She looks like she wants to say something, but she holds her tongue and she says, just, just please find what you can, Jasper. I will. Don't worry about that. All right. I'm off. Can I have a few of those, uh, gents over there? And he just gestures to, like, two random soldiers, I imagine, who are just sort of stacking stuff. I'm not going to be carrying carts anywhere, but it'd be nice to have someone who could help me. She snaps her fingers, whistles, and they both, like, stop what they're doing, fumbling with boxes, and look over at Arendelle. She says, Hey, you're with him. Do what he says. Thank you, Arendelle. Come on, folks. We have work to do. And he's going to take out a leaflet from his belt. Like, he has a bunch of, like, parchments just kind of all folded up. And he's just going to sort of look down and grimace and just sort of tear a piece of the parchment off and put the rest of it back in his belt, take out a quill and start making notes as he's walking. He's gonna see what he can find. Can I get a farming lore check from you? Farming lore, let's go! Thought it would never come up. You were like, he's never gonna use. No, I, I knew, I know you well enough. I knew I was going to, and if you weren't gonna set up first, I was gonna set up first. My ass can be planting corn before I let that skill go to waste. I'm gonna re-roll that. So you, set about looking around the places that you best estimate a cart would be. And in your mind, it would be probably the granary, probably where they store all of their food. So you and the two mercenaries in tow make your way across the field to a large storage facility on the opposite end of this basin north of the mill that you saw when you entered town. There you have the two men open the large wooden doors and almost comically, the only thing that skitters out are two mice. Just <laughs> there's no food in there whatsoever. Well, that'd be disappointing if I actually had any hope for it. But the car will do, I think. And he sort of walks over and Men, hold it steady for a minute. If I fall, I'm going to scream in a timber that probably won't be very good for my image. And he's going to bring his hands over and try to uh, get himself up a little bit. As you round the corner into this facility, you see two horses kind of barricaded on the other side of the wall by the cart. But there's nothing really preventing them from just clearing this cart. And they're looking a little bit spooked. They haven't seen people in... Who knows how long? No one move. Do either of you two have rope? They look around very quickly and find some like tied to the rafter. The next dumb question. Do either of you two have any rations? Left? They look to each other and they like look back at you and shake their head. No. All right, you. You're going to run back to the mayor's house. 
for a piece of salt lick. You're gonna do it now. I want you back in five minutes. Get the let out. Yeah, he bolts. Just doom. not three minutes later, he returns with a cube, handing it to you. Thank you. You can take a breather. You probably deserve it. He's sweating. <laughs> Relax. Good job. You did well. All right. Nature roll, please. Oh my goodness. With a <laughs> the horse that you extend it to, startled, lashes out, taking the cart and sending you careening and tumbling off the side. Let's get some initiative rolls here. All right, an initiative it is. Okay, the horse goes first. I figure Jasper is still on his ass, having just been thrown off. So the horse kicks the cart and tries to follow it up by running across it, which the cart is now on its side. You can hear wood shatter as the horse awkwardly tumbles over it, rolling off to its side and is now on the ground, almost on top of you, Jasper. What do you do? Now that he's very much being forced to deal with this, he's going to shout, get the rope, tie them up now and he's going to i'm going to see if I, he can't grapple him because he's trying not to kill the horse he just wants to get around this thing's neck and calm it the hell down not ride it either i want to make this clear jasper is no cavalryman not yet so he is interested in just getting on its side holding it by its head and just sort of gently trying to ease it onto its side like it's already on the ground he's just trying to like grab it and just be like Shh, stop like kind of applying pressure to make it Hopefully, if not submit, at least be quiet. We have our unarmed strike. Okay, so you scramble towards the horse, and as you try to jump on top of it, it gets up at the last second. You're wrapped on it, and now it is bucking wildly with you on its back. You have two actions left. All right, yep, nope, we're just going for another unarmed attack. That's all I can do. He's not trying to really injure this thing. He's just locked his arm around it, and he's just trying to calm it down. He's going, stop, 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 ow, stop. And he's just like shouting at this thing to calm it down as he's trying to sort of hold it in place while the guys are hopefully getting closer with the rope to tie it up. As you are doing your best to get it calm to the point where it can be entangled by your subordinates, you feel it moving around the inside of this granary before it finally lets this huge and hits violently a door on the inside. You can hear the wood snapping and shattering as whatever blockade that was stuck on the opposite side of it buckles under the weight of this horse's massive strength. As the door flies inwards, I'm going to need you to make me a reflex or a fortitude save. Your choice. I'll take the reflex. This horse is bucking wildly, but you are able to stay on its back all the while. As the other two men approach with the rope, they begin trying to lasso it, throwing the rope again and again, just missing wildly as it's turning in circles now, doing the bronco buck. Jasper, we go back to you, buddy. Jasper, again, is not really on this thing's back. He's off its side, very much kind of like a rodeo clown, trying to like almost arm lock it around its head. Is this thing wearing a bridle or anything? Any kind of... No. As he's hanging on there, he's going to see if he can remember an old trick his father taught him to calm wild farm animals, which I'm going to presume that he's smarter than me. And as a result, he's probably going to... Uh, he's probably going to do something along the lines of like, just like a, it's all right. It's all right. Stop. Stop calm. And he... So I would like to, if I could, make a farming lore roll as a method of him attempting to move it down. Because he's already got this thing with his arms around it. He's not trying to do more than that. It's not like he's going to choke out a horse. That's not going to work. Oh, yeah. How do you calm this horse down? That is, that's like the most interesting way I've ever done a how do you fucking kill this guy? How do you calm this horse down? As he's got this thing, his arm around its neck, he's just going to reach up and gently just put his hand on the bridge of its nose and gently pull it down. It's okay, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. No one's, no one's going to hurt you. No one's, relax, there you are, good. He's just gonna, I'm gonna assume male because this thing's bucking like a Mustang. This is Bessie, this is the girl. The male is just quietly watching as all of this is happening. Of course, I'd presume the wrong thing. So 
So he he'd be smart enough to have looked for the bits, and so he would just. Yeah, there you go, girl. There you go. Calm down. Calm down. You with the rope. Hurry up. He very quickly shuffles over to give it to you. Okay. Okay. It's going to be all right. And he's just going to gently and loosely loop it around its neck. Just tie it. Not even a slip knot. A nice, comfortable square knot. When <laughs> it's not going to tighten on this thing or choke it out if it runs and catches on something. All right, easy. He's just gonna hold the rope out and just, we're friends here. You still have that salt? He hands it to you. Here, friend, relax, girl. He's just gonna hold it out and, he's holding it out in the flat of his hand, as far from his body as possible that she can come over when she wants. Now calm, the horse slowly, cautiously makes its way up to you and takes a big old lick of salt. Once it does that, its eyes go wide, and then it's like a dog with whipped cream. It just, it's going crazy. There you go. Come on. Let's get you back. And then, Jasper, you see something that probably turns your day around a little bit. The cart that the horse kicked is fucked. There is no repairing that. It got kicked in half, damn near. Behind the door that this horse kicked open, however, there is a carriage. It's covered, but you can tell that it is no mere cart because the wood of the wheels is a lot thinner and a lot sturdier. It's actually bolted on there, not just screwed on there. Well, if luck would have it today. Hey, you're a good horse, Bessie. Thank you. All right, men, get the other one in there. Be careful. I'm not doing this again. See what you can do about that cart. One of them... The one that just handed you the salt lick continues walking into the room, pulls the cover off of the carriage, and you can see rather ornate engravings in the wood, indicating porcine creatures in the structure of it. There's a door on the back of it that's locked, and the man says, Hey, Jasper, you might want to take a look at this. Right, let me take a peek. Here, what's your name if I might ask? And he just sort of, towards the guy I'm assuming, one who didn't provide the, the salt lick. Jim. Jim, hold this. She's a good girl. Keep telling her that. Be gentle. And if she does anything stupid, it's on you, friend. And she's, he's just going to pat him on the shoulder and jog with a couple of, like, <laughs> grunts as he's doing it because he's trying to get there as quick as possible. Jasper, can I get a crafting roll from you to see if you can figure out the best way to open this lock? He, uh, as opposed to using his swords, he reaches behind him and takes one of the hatchets that he carries around to throw. Then he sort of flips it and just and he literally chops a little triangle around where the lock is to remove it from the door. What you see on the other side of it, a veritable armory, a collection of some 50 odd weapons. And when you pick up the nearest javelin that just seems to be sitting, you see a forge marking. This is castle forged steel. Vince, I think we might have just found what we need. And now we pivot over to Merrick and the boar. Merrick, you have just plunged your javelin into this creature. It has squealed a horrific squeal of pain, and it is charging straight towards your men. You see it tear one up, literally run him over and gash him with its tusk. A huge well of blood is pooling around him, and the boar turns around in a great arc, getting ready to charge again. All right, so the boar is going to go first. It's attacking Merrick. It is going to complete this huge arc. It is, it is coming straight at you, buddy. So he is going to make a tusk strike against you. Oh my goodness, that is a hit. The boar comes charging at you, Merrick. It slams into your legs and you feel yourself land on your head. The world goes black for a couple of moments and then you don't really know exactly how long later. Amelia standing above you, slapping you in the face like, Merrick, Merrick, this is, this is not the time to sleep. I need you, Merrick. Where is it in relation to me and where are we? You are about 10 feet away from the rock where the boar flipped you over, and the boar is currently about 15 feet away from you, tearing up another of your comrades. Cool. So stand up. That's one action. I'm going to rage as another action. And I had a javelin in hand. I'm going to throw that javelin at the boar. The piggy screams out in pain yet again as another javelin comes sailing through the air and hits him 
This time in the eye, what should have been a brain shot stops short. And it is, at this point, you can see it is literally like almost killing the person that it is messing with. As a free action, I hope I'm going to turn to Amelia, just shout, go! But I assume that Merrick's feral state, it just comes out as a wordless snarl. She goes from scared to almost locked down. She's in fear. She just, oh, oh, shit. Oh, okay, okay. And she just takes off running into the woods. The boar is, it is going to continue with the person that it is currently stomping on. And by the time the boar has stopped thrusting its jaws forward and the, the dust clears, the man is not moving. I'm going to, as one action, draw my uh, greatsword, which is one action, and I'm going to perform a sudden charge. How does the boar die? I take my greatsword down and I basically hold it like it's a lance and I fling myself into it leveraging my entire body weight so that's as i strike right where i would have the between the jaw and the ear i basically lunge into it forcing my entire body weight through as the great sword pierces at the other side cutting off its windpipe entirely there is no more noise it just falls with a hearty there's a few seconds pause before from the tree line we can see amelia's face poking out is it is it over still almost like vibrating Merrick takes his seconds to like puts his foot against the boar's head, pulls out his greatsword, wipes it off on the pelt. Are either of the others alive? One of them pretty banged up, but the other is incomplete. Fine. He's he's okay. So one of them's dead though, yeah? Yeah, one of them is dead. I point to the one that looks good, that's alright, and say, you carry him back, and I point to the dead one, and I point to the one that's beat up. You're gonna help me with this. And Without answering Amelia, we start dragging the boar back to camp. Yeah, it takes it takes all of your might, and it's going to take a long walk back to camp. We pivot back over to Yara. As the man has reached out for the bucket and is going to try to hit you with it, Yara. But I first need initiative rolls. Ooh, looks like he's going first. All right. Clements the Bandit trying to hit you with this bucket. He reaches out for it, grabs it, and there's a huge slosh of water as it comes spilling all around, but he swings and misses. He stands up with another action, and he is going to try to punch you with his third action. And he, he solid connects with a critical hit on a natural 20. So he swings with both of his hands and lambs against your head. You take 10 damage. Yeah, there's blood that pops from your mouth and you can feel your tooth like where you bit into your lip. He's got a wild look in his eyes. Just a few moments ago, he was talking to you mostly normally. And now I think you said something that pissed him off. No, we can't settle this with words and we shall with fists. Almost reflexively, without thinking, as the bandit's fist connects with Yara's face, you see the bucket that has presumably fallen onto the ground fly up on its own in the direction of the back of the bandit's head. That is a hit. Actually, that is a crit because he's not wearing his armor. So how do you knock out Clements? He doesn't even think about it. Just as soon as the pain uh, starts spreading through her face, you just see her eyes flash, and he just feels something, the bucket, connect into the back of his head, or his world goes black. And then she spits out some of the blood on the ground next to him. She shakes her head, like, could have done that the easy way, chose the hard way, and then I bought him up again, much tighter this time. All right, I'll tell you what you want to know. Okay. What did you hit me with? I don't know what you're talking about. You want answers? Ask your fucking questions. The gruff tone from his voice completely gone. Why were you and the rest of your party here? The sweet ace. They, they pressed me and all the other people that they put into prison into service. For what purpose? Told us that they were going to give us a second shot at life. We were going to follow Captain down into the moors. Gonna raise a little hell. And then we were gonna march into Latria. Start raiding. 
taking things and bringing them back so that we could pay our debt to society that way. That is what the sweet ace told you. He nods his head, yes. What do they get out of all that? I don't know. All I know is they were going to give us a bunch of weapons and send us to go, you know, attack villages. So your freedom is worth the innocent lives of those who have never offended you? What would you choose? It's life or death. I don't want to die. That is understandable. In light of your honesty, I will see that someone comes and tends to your wounds and some more food and water will be brought to you. I expect you to continue to be cooperative. You want to know where the mayor went, huh? That would be welcome to know. All right. We set on the town back in Aurora, dead of winter. Some of the villagers that lived on the outskirts saw us coming first, and they came to warn the mayor, is what I can only guess, because we saw them heading out in force with only the things that they could carry. Captain Sweet A told us to secure the town, but me and four others were sent to scout after them, see where they went. We tracked them about two days north of this village. It's an abandoned mining town, but we booked it. There was something out in those woods something following us. We didn't stick around to see what happened after they made it to that town. And the mayor? He led them. He was out in front. Little girl, too. Is that all the information you can provide me? Think carefully before you reply. There's some Gretchen off the road. They probably attack whatever and whoever they can get their hands on. Yara nods. And uh, checks his bindings one last time before going to see what she said. Get someone to check on his wounds, give him some food, make sure that nobody is going to off him in his sleep. He seems pretty defeated, and now that he's suffered a concussion as well, you are pretty sure he's not going to be in any condition to fight. If he can be rehabilitated, then she will recommend to Soren that perhaps they see if he'd be willing to join their mercenary group. The sun setting over the horizon, we can see Jasper has accomplished his mission, the carriage being ferried out to the mayor's house. Yara, having finished her obligations, making her way back to the mayor's house as well to let Sora know that she accomplished her job. And Merrick, it is at about this point you are arriving back to the outskirts of Urshrit with this massive boar in tow. Amelia is walking next to you. She hasn't said much on this walk back. She's intimidated by you yelling at her. She knew that you weren't mad at her, but it put her off a little bit. After we deliver the boar to Joaquin to do with it whatever he will, I, I tell the injured one to go to Darendar and I, and I take Amelia to the side. And I go, listen, I know who you are. What, what do you mean? I'm... Just Amelia, you know. I know who you are. Her expression changes, just like... Thorne told me to expose you to the reality of this kind of life. What I did with the boar was not easy. You were better off where you were before. That's supposed to make me want to go home. Hopefully, yes. I've shown you what this life can be like. What you do now is in your hands. She looks over to the man who is carrying the corpse, looks back at Joachim, who is telling some other men how he wants the boar strung up, and then looks back at you. Currently has a hole in his torso, a new one. Her eyes rest on it for a minute, and she kind of winces before locking eyes with you. I think I found exactly where I'm supposed to be. Merrick doesn't say anything. He doesn't. He just looks at her in her eyes for a minute. And I guess maybe he wants to see how much does she believe that? How much does she feel committed to that idea? Uh, but either way, He's going to go to Soren and tell her, hey, this is what happened. Make me a perception check. She means every word. We close on this conversation with her opening up to Merrick about her life. She tells him about how she has no love for her adoptive father and how to him, she has been little more than a political tool, a prisoner of peace, as it were, that... In the dead of night, her parents were killed when she was a little girl. And ever since then, she has lived with Lord Corwin, 
she does not believe that his hands are entirely clean in that regard either, because her parents were very wealthy merchants in his domain. And in fact, their wine was said to have even rivaled that of his household, which his household is well renowned for the wine that they make. Merrick will wait for her to finish her story and he'll nod. Still need to tell Soren about what happened today, about this conversation. I hope you tell him that I'm staying. Be ready early tomorrow. Get yourself some better armor. She just looks down, and I think as Merrick walks off, that's where we pan up to the stars and then down again, where we can see Hope and Talman, as well as a crowd of the mercenaries that have served in battle today, gathered to watch the last rites of the two men that fell in battle. A third is added to the tally for too long. Hope. As you are delivering these last rites, feel a stir of memory unwind within your mind. It takes you to a time where you were taught the preservation and the internment of humans that have passed away. At this time, your master, Amon, mused on the very nature of death and how he believes that death is not the end of a soul's journey, but rather the doorway to the next life, the culmination of all of our efforts here on Illyria and our reward for living the lives that we saw fit. You come to, once again, with the feeling of being crushed, of your torso feeling as if it is under severe pressure, only to realize that it is Tommen hugging you and weeping openly into your shoulder. He pulls his head back and locks his eyes with you, and he tells you, it's okay, I can be strong for you. Hope lets out a... A breath that's uh, been caught for a while now, and he hugs him back. The mercenaries in the crowd gathered around to watch mourn in their own ways, some letting the tears run, others more reserved. Merrick and Yara and Jasper, you have arrived to this gathering just now. Is there anything that any of you would like to do? I think Jasper coming upon this and seeing Toman at the front hugging Hope and seeing the crowd would walk up to where the two of them are and put a supportive hand on Tillman's shoulder, the gentle pat, a good kid, doing good. Yara would go join Hope where he is preparing the bodies. She waits until after the burning and will gather some of the ashes and use them to perform a last sacrifice to the gods, as is custom with her tribe. I'm standing away. I don't know these customs, and I don't want to insult them. Uh, nevertheless, you are still close enough to hear. Yara, you are as well as you're approaching. Tommen takes his head out of Hope's shoulder, wipes the tears from his eyes, and looks at Jasper. I'm going to be the Bannerman. He gives a smile before turning his head back to his friend. It's what he would have wanted. Another tear rolls down his cheek, and as the ashes billow up into the open sky above. Three shooting stars trace their distance across its face. 